Ambition is both the devil and angel gracing the shoulders of humankind. Having crawled from primordial murk and into the fleshy thrones of consciousness, humans have created unparalleled art beside unspeakable atrocities. We take existence by the day, yet our societies and actions have scaled to such extremes that one decision can impact entire civilizations. Massacres, genocides, wars, all owing themselves sometimes to mere volatile instincts and intuitions. An intricate web of hierarchies, psychological pressures, and cultural environments push and prod us into movement. We stand, walk, speak, and dress in ways that evolution could never have accounted for. Despite the skins we evolved out of, we still very much have beasts lurking in us. They sprint in concrete forests, bite and claw at prey in brick mazes. They scream in the smoggy bowels of inner cities, where frosty breath dissipates, but nightmares settle into the fog between alleyways. Our survival is not always food or shelter, but aspirations, accumulations, status and acquirements, art and schemes. But some people struggle to find their place, to have their voices heard. Some people don't climb the common ladder which society presents. Some people were born with minds willing to traverse the hells of human suffering, if only to taste the notoriety and success of more fortunate individuals. And it is common that we refer to these people as psychopaths. But there was a time when we were yet to find a name for such individuals, because society was just erupting and crafting a new kind of monster. One of these creatures was H. H. Holmes. And this is Mania. Welcome to the White City Ripper. We descend into the late 19th century of Chicago, before the completion of the Statue of Liberty, the Trunian Bascule Bridge, and even the Great Fire which ravaged the city. We find ourselves in a time when air was still stained by the thick dark smoke of oil lamps. Though electricity was making humble introductions, it could not cast light on the dangerous personalities which heavily populated cities were now cultivating. Caleb Carr once said, the year 1896 was the moment in history when the modern idea of a serial killer became available. A little more than ten years prior to that is where our story begins, at a time when such characters operated in the shadows of our scrutiny. They lurked and matured beneath our inability to understand them. Their fingerprints had no databases. The bloodied scenes they left behind, full of clues for the modern detective, but for the 19th century police forces, they were barren, mere homes for the ghosts of victims. H. H. Holmes is an enigma. His tale is confused, first by the accounts of the journalists and newspapers eager to hear, dramatize, and spread the accounts of his murderous plots. Secondly, like any story, his has become muddled by the infinite changing of hands, the endless exaggerations, the details taken with liberty. By now, Holmes is like the Johnny Appleseed of killers, but like any tall tale, there's always a kernel of truth at its heart, or, in this case, a buried body. Let's tug on a string and see where it takes us. And what better way to start than with the name? Holmes didn't come into this world with the name he used when committing the majority of his crimes. He was born on May 16th, 1861, as Herman Webster Mudgett. But for the sake of clarity, I will refer to him as the name which garnered such a dark reputation. Before the end of his life, he confessed to 27 murders, with only 8 being plausibly confirmed. More confusing still, several people he claimed to have murdered were, in fact, still alive once they had investigated it. The fact is that people whose lives came into close contact with Holmes often disappeared. He would spread like a toxin slowly encroaching before snuffing out unsuspecting friends or romantic partners. Oftentimes, they would allegedly travel to other states after being in close contact with him, only to drop all contacts with relatives and friends, their whereabouts decidedly unknown. That is why, altogether, he is said to have killed as many as 200 people. And for this, he is still considered one of America's most prolific serial killers. But Holmes is special. Not just his productivity and sheer body count, 
not even the fact that he constructed a false hotel by which to conduct the bulk of his killings. Rather, it was his sense of industriousness. When we think of murderers, people like Ted Bundy come to mind. They have an obsession with killing or acts of violent sexual nature. And this seems to be part and parcel with murder itself, the act of taking a life. The satisfaction of watching it fade, it's central. But Holmes, though still lacking a sense of humanity, at least comes with a cushion of ulterior motives alongside his fascination with bodies. And put simply, it's money. Holmes's parents were descended from the first English immigrants in the New Hampshire area. Despite psychologists trying to make an easy case of his future crimes and behavior, there actually is no hard evidence of domestic abuse or trauma to set him on the path of a callous murderer. In fact, he was raised in an affluent family, and enjoyed an upbringing many in his time did not. Even still, with a well-off upbringing, it's no small wonder that Holmes would grow to have ambitions of his own. It's there, in the rudiments of a gentle childhood, that I believe his aspirations first bloomed. I think many people can relate to this. A sense of urgency, desperation, or even ambition, to attain more comfort than we have, whether we were raised well or not. We seek to replicate or improve the stability we had been given as children. We decide that settling for contentment has a sour taste to it, so we look up, out, or over at something else, wondering if we'll feel a satisfaction upon attaining it. One wonders just how the path of a notorious serial killer unfolds. We are used to the common tale of explosive behavior, uncontrollable urges, freak incidents which start a catastrophic string of events. But ironically enough, the hints of his ominous behavior grew out of his interest in medicine, though it would appear he quickly lost the plot when it came to living subjects and the empathetic side of becoming a doctor, because instead, Holmes found a passion in the lifeless. His education began at the University of Michigan in the Department of Medicine and Surgery. Under Professor Herdman, the chief anatomy instructor, he worked in an anatomy lab. The fleshy mechanisms of the human body became familiar to Holmes. The sight of what made humans so different and unique and yet similar to other animals, the gory reality of our complex processes, became commonplace. And when he was apprenticed in New Hampshire under Dr. Nahum White, a noted advocate of human dissection, this fascination with the study of corpses only deepened. And by 1884, he had graduated. But long before then, he began to feel something, a chill, a creeping existential struggle. The long hours of studying bodies imprinted themselves upon him. The sanctity of life boasted by spiritual philosophies began to feel hollow. What was there besides bodies and senses, cause and consequence, living and dead? The young surgeon dwelled in the horror we all face, the hell of intuitions and philosophies raging between our skulls, where, on one hand, life seems precious, orchestrated, maybe even holy, and on the other, undeniably chaotic, freakish, disturbing. The turbulence in Holmes's mind expressed itself as he began to see the corpses he worked with as opportunities. Throughout his college career, he began various frauds and scams. At the University of Michigan, he was known to steal bodies and use them to make false insurance claims, and during the small hours of the evening, for those specimens scheduled for cremation, he would tinker and experiment alone in the morgue. The quiet tinkling of scalpels, his amused muttering, and watchful gaze upon the morbid components beneath his hands. These were the elements of Holmes's passion. These were the makings of an entrepreneur whose primary product was the dearly departed. One evening, Holmes sits alone in the dim fluttering of an oil lamp. The tips of his fingers shine in that amber light with a blackened hue stretching to his wrists. His eyes are still as they fall upon the pride-opened ribcage of a recent experiment. Thoughts flow through his head while he sits in the stillness of this moment, the tension 
because for once, there was something different besides the existential dread running its fingers along his spine. There is a scheme. Though the oil lamp sputters out beside him, casting his shadow one last time over the body before allowing the study to be enveloped by blackness, a spark has just ignited in Holmes' head, and beside the cadaver, a grin grows on his face that nobody sees. His experiment that evening may be over, but the real work has just begun. Right, before I get into the crypt cleaning and notes about this episode, I do have some fantastic news. And that is that this episode is brought to you by Audible. Audible is a wonderful way to squeeze in the reading time that you just do not have in the day. When I first signed up for Audible, I listened to Johannes Cabal, the necromancer. It was so wonderful and haunting. And you can listen to it too, because with this free trial, you can get any audiobook of your choosing complimentary with it. So, just go to www.audibletrial.com forward slash mania and enjoy a book on the house. That is www.audibletrial.com forward slash mania. And not only will you be able to get to read a free book, but you're going to be supporting the show directly, and that is so very helpful. So, thank you very much. Well, welcome back from that. Yes, probably the first note, um... In Crypt Cleaning, we'll be addressing this new sponsorship. But before we get into that, let's talk about the episode. So, this was the first segment of the White City Ripper. I'm very excited to bring it to you because Holmes is a very complex character, and I do not think I'll be finished with him until I've written about three episodes or so. I wanted this one to be more of an introduction, and I know it's different for me to do a cliffhanger, but it seemed fitting because the next episode is just going to be a very... Uh, well, fluid sequence, almost like uh, 20 or 30 minutes of a movie. Because the story that comes from Holmes' life that I found the most interesting is just so bizarre and yet so well told by him. So I'm going to translate it and give it to you personally. And I do think it's an anecdote that even people who are avid fans or not fans, but you know, they're interested in serial killers. I don't think they'll know this tidbit about Holmes or this, this scheme that he was hatching. So... Look forward to that, that'll be coming out soon, and now with the crypt cleaning. And this crypt is indeed messy, what with the elephant in the room being the Audible sponsorship. Actually, I'm very excited about it. First and foremost, I want to tell everyone with transparency that I intend to keep the ads at the beginning or the end of the episode. I don't really want to interrupt the narration. But secondly, to also be just entirely genuine, I think it's a great service. Listeners are going to be able to get a free month of Audible. They can listen to a book that they perhaps didn't want to splurge on, and they can support Mania while doing it. Really, it's just fantastic, and I'm very excited for it. It'll be a very practical way to support and bolster the well-being of the show. So really, all that's left is to say thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who's been supporting the show from the beginning, whether you're going to sign up for a trial, whether you're going to talk to your friends about Mania, whether you're going to start a death cult about it, Really, whatever you do, it's fantastic, and I have so much gratitude for everyone just putting in the effort to really bring it to life. You have no idea how much it means to me. I'm constantly just having my days made by people sharing it around, expressing their excitement or their enjoyment in the stories. So really, the mania train does not run without its listeners, so you have yourself to thank for that. And honestly, I do hope you get to enjoy a a free book out of it, so... Thank you very much, and I sincerely hope you'll join me next time.